Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first lesson in our second unit in eighth grade social studies. In this unit, we will be exploring the concept of justice and how the government of the United States was created and how it was set up to be the government that we know today. Our essential question for this entire unit of study, which will go across the top of your notes, is how did America try to create a government that served justice? I will give you a moment to write that down, and then I will advance to the next slide. The next slide is simply a review of vocabulary, which we have already done. We are always learn our vocabulary prior to the unit itself. So you have already had your quiz on these words, but these words will be used uh, throughout the lessons of our unit on justice. In this particular lesson, you're going to hear the word territory used. So we're going to go ahead and review that term. A territory is a region designated by Congress under a governor that can later apply to become a state. Our first left side question in this lesson is, what were the challenges in creating a new government for the former colonies? Uh, just to refresh your memory, at this point we fought the revolution, we had a war against the British, uh, although we didn't learn about the details of the war, we eventually won the war with the help of France. And at the end of that, we actually earned the right to be our own country and to govern ourselves. But the question is, what was that government going to look like? Were we going to live under a king or queen of our own? Because we kicked out the British and the king of England. So we had to come up with our own system for governing ourselves. So let's talk about that. First thing you know is that the colonies still thought of themselves as their own countries, not as one nation. So when the war was over, you had 13 colonies that had 13 different ideas of what they wanted, and each one of them felt like they had a right to do what they wanted. There was no unifying national government to cause those colonies, now states, to think of themselves as being one country. So they had fiercely independent identities and they did not want to give power to a central government. Each colony, each state now, had its own ideas, its own beliefs, its own culture, its own way of doing things, and none of them particularly wanted some powerful central force telling them what to do. In fact, it was because the British were a powerful central force that tried to tell the colonies what to do that the revolution was fought in the first place. So they did not want to duplicate, they did not want to replicate, they did not want to copy a system that would basically do the same thing in different clothes. So they had to create a new system in the middle of a war because during the Revolutionary War, we actually needed to govern ourselves and we had to have a system of making decisions. So these decisions had to be made while the war was being fought. So, because this had never been done before, just creating a government from scratch and not having a king or queen, this was all new. This was being done for the first time. So today we live in a world where there are many democratic systems of government. We were basically inventing it for the first time. So we invented a system of government that were called the Articles of Confederation. And most Americans do not know this, but the Articles of Confederation were the title of the first government of the United States. So our left side question is, what were the Articles of Confederation? Quite simply, the Articles of Confederation were the name of the document that created our first government in the United States. It didn't last for very long. Most Americans don't know about it. And these days, it's so far in the past that most people have forgotten, but you are taking eighth grade social studies and knowing about the Articles of Confederation 
is something that is important if you want to understand the history of our country. Uh, the Articles of Confederation basically created, and this is a quote from the document, a firm league of friendship between the states. So basically like say, hey, we're cool to hang together, but uh, that's it. So it didn't bind the states into having to follow anything. It was like, hey, we're all agreeing to this. As long as we agree to this, it's cool. But if we disagree, there's nothing in this document that can force us to do anything. So it gave Congress a couple of powers. And keep in mind, under the Articles of Confederation, we only had a Congress. We did not have a president. We did not have a court system. So in terms of your vocabulary, we only had a legislative branch of government. We did not have an executive and we did not have a judicial branch. So the Congress under the Articles of Confederation had a few powers and they were very limited. The first was that they could make war and peace. So they could vote to declare war and they could vote to ratify peace treaties. Um, they could raise an army and a navy. So if the country was threatened, they could vote to say, okay, all the states have to donate soldiers and ships so that we can actually have an army and navy to protect the country. They created a postal service, so they created an, an efficient system of delivering mail and communication based on the technology of the time between all 13 of the colonies. And they did print money, although it was called the continental currency, and it was basically worthless. So basically, uh, if you haven't picked up my vibe, uh, this government was very weak. It didn't have the power to enforce much of anything. Um, it didn't have money to back it up because you'll notice one of the powers it didn't have was the power to tax. And as a government, if you can't tax, you don't have money. And if you don't have money, you can't do much. So um, I like to say that the Articles of Confederation government was like a decaf, non-fat latte. Very weak. And what's the point? So let's talk specifically about the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Your left side question is, what were the weaknesses of the Articles? I'll give you a moment to write that down because I'm about to enumerate and list those weaknesses. First weakness of the Articles is that each state only had one vote, no matter how big that state was or how small it was. So Rhode Island was a teeny tiny state, New York was a big, powerful state. And keep in mind, when we're talking about this, we're not just talking about geography, we're talking about population. So Rhode Island had a very small population, New York had a very big population, but they each had the same amount of power in the Continental Congress under the Articles of Confederation. The Congress did not have the power to levy taxes. And as I said on the previous slide, if you can't levy taxes, you can't spend money. And if you can't spend money, you can't do much if you're the government of a country. Um, if you wanted to change the Articles of Confederation, agreement had to be unanimous. In other words, all 13 states had to agree. Uh, the likelihood of that kind of thing happening, not so great, kids. Uh, imagine if you have 12 brothers and sisters and you all have to agree together in order to make some kind of decision, I don't think that's happening. Even though I'm an only child, I just imagine that would be extremely challenging. Um, there was no national court system. So if any of the states had a disagreement with each other, there was no place they could go to adjudicate those disagreements. There was no place they could go to present their arguments to a third party that wasn't involved and have that third party make a decision that was binding on them, that would force them to do one thing or another thing. So um, that's kind of like having a school without a principal or a behavior specialist. That might sound good to you, but in practice, it would be a disaster. Uh, there was no single leader. 
There was no person in charge. There was no president of the United States. All you had was a Congress. Any kind of decision that needed to be made needed to be made as a group. There was no single person who could step in and say, I am the decider, with apologies to George W. Bush. And finally, they could not regulate commerce between the states. So each state could have its own tax laws. Each state could have its own laws about what things could and could not be sold there. And so instead of one national economy, you ended up having 13 state economies, and that did not work so well. So as you can see here, there were a lot of weaknesses to the Articles of Confederation. In the next lesson, um, we are going to learn about um, some things that actually were accomplished under the Articles, and we're going to learn about some challenges that took place under the Articles, which led to the fact that we no longer live under the Articles. Uh, the final weakness of the Articles of Confederation is that it took nine out of 13 states to pass a law. That's what we call a supermajority. If you were going by majority rule, it should have been 7 out of 13 because that would have gotten you slightly over 50%. But it took 9 out of 13 states to agree to pass laws, which was slightly less than two-thirds. So it made it very difficult to pass laws, especially since the southern states, in many cases, had a different perspective on things than the middle colonies or the middle states and the New England states. Remember, they're no longer colonies, folks. They're states. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of our first lesson. Uh, as always, I'm going to ask you to take those left side questions, answer them in one or two sentences, and write yourself an amazing summary. Chances are I'm going to come around and check those and stamp them. I might even have you share them with the class. So please take this seriously and go ahead and write your summary. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Blumenthal once again signing off on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies.